so uh, welcome to uh, this month's webinar uh, in our webinar series. This is Ben Knoll. I'm the Director of Patient-Centered Research with the Global Healthy Living Foundation, Creaky Joints. Uh, this month's webinar is uh, about gout. Um, this is a, a perfect day to do it because it's Gout Awareness Day. Uh, today on May 22nd. And we're feel very privileged to have uh, to be joined this evening by Dr. Theodore Fields or Ted Fields. Uh, he's a professor of clinical medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College and also an attending physician at the Hospital for Special Surgery or HSS. Uh, both are in New York City. Uh, this evening's webinar is called Gout Fact versus Fiction Clearing Up Misconceptions About This Treatable Chronic Conditions. Uh, so Dr. Field specializes in the treatment of gout, uh, but also rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. He's been recognized as a top doctor by Castle Connolly and New York Magazine, among others. Uh, Dr. Fields holds many professional appointments, including director of the HSS Rheumatology website project and a member of the HSS Medical Board and the Board of Directors of the HSS Physician Hospital Organization. Uh, so we're delighted uh, to be joined by Dr. Fields this evening and to, to be able to benefit from his expertise uh, to learn more about uh, this, this condition that's, that's quite common um, and uh, to talk about some of the misunderstandings and, and deepen our, our understanding both as an organization about gout and, and also to help uh, broadcast to our, uh, the patients uh, and other caregivers in our community. So with that, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Fields, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Ben, and welcome, everyone. Happy to talk about gout on Gout Awareness Day. And the opening slide just reminds those with gout or those whose loved ones have gout just how painful gout can be. People think they fracture their foot uh, or they burn their foot. The intensity can be very high, so it's really a condition that it's very worthwhile to try to prevent. So our topic today is fact versus fiction, trying to clear up misconceptions about gout, which is really a very treatable condition, although some people think they have to live with it. And we'll try to talk about that and make people really see that uh, this is something, if you've got gout, you can get rid of it. So my disclosures, these are a couple of companies that I've consulted for, but to make the point about this evening's presentation, is that no products will be mentioned by brand name. And the focus of this presentation is really to look at why people get gout and how possible it is to get it under control without really an emphasis on one particular medication versus another. So what I'm gonna try to go over, these are the topics I'll try to cover um, this evening. Um, first, why do people often think their gout attacks can't be prevented? I often see people who think that they've got to live with a certain number of gout attacks every year. That's just the way it is. And I think hopefully this discussion will help you see that, that that's not the case. We'll talk a little bit about what causes gout. It's a nice thing to deal with this condition because we really do understand very well how gout comes about. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of gout. How do we know what we know about gout? And it's got a very interesting history going all the way back to Hippocrates. And we'll talk about that. And then how can you be sure you have gout? It's not absolute, not every case is absolutely clear cut. Somebody with a swollen knee, for example, as opposed to the classical big toe. Sometimes there are other things that can look like gout. And we'll talk a little bit about that, how the doctor thinks about whether somebody absolutely has gout. And it's important because the treatments for gout are generally lifelong treatments. So it's important to have a really correct diagnosis. Then we'll talk a bit about facts and misconceptions about diet and gout. And diet and gout is certainly important, but it's not the whole story. There's really a, a large genetic factor, and we'll talk about that. And then facts and misconceptions about medications for gout. There's a lot of things that, that people don't think about when it comes to gout medications. And in reality, gout medications are pretty complicated, at least in the beginning when we first start treating gout because as you'll see, we'll talk about it in detail, but there's three different kinds of treatment for gout. There's treatment for an attack or a flare of gout. There's treatment for 
uh, long-term prevention, lowering the uric acid, and then there's medication that we use to try to protect you when we first start a medication to lower the uric acid because you're more likely to get a flare. Don't worry, we'll talk about that more because that, that's something that, that sort of doesn't necessarily make, make sense to people when they first hear it, but it's an important part of gout management that when we first start a medication to lower the uric acid, we need to try to make an extra effort to prevent gout attacks. And then finally, we'll talk about how do you work with your doctor for long-term gout control? How do you think about the overall management of, of gout long-term. All right, so we'll start by discussing why do people often think their gout attacks can't be prevented? And this is from a uh, Creaky Joints survey where they ask uh, people with gout whether or not they accept that painful gout attacks, flares, are part of living with a disease. And it's kind of unfortunate that 68% of people either agreed or disagreed, and hopefully by the end of this discussion, you'll see that the likelihood of being gout-free is extremely high uh, on the right regimen, generally including a medication. And on the right regimen, the likelihood of being gout-free is extremely high. And at 68%, there's 1,000 patients with gout who are surveyed, plus 500 of their caregivers. Uh, but this is of the patients, the 1,000 patients. 68% thought, that's, I accept it, that that's the way it is living with gout. So hopefully that can change. Um, so and those same 1,000 patients with gout had an average of almost eight attacks a year, and we know that we can get them to zero. So it's really kind of unfortunate that people had to live with that many attacks. So the irony of gout management is that it's one of the most effectively treated of all the rheumatic diseases. And I put it in quotes, cure, because you generally need to be on medication and stay on medication. So it's not a drug-free cure, but it's a pretty safe medication cure, and it's something that that's, can last for a lifetime. And yet, gout is one of, if not the absolute worst managed disease. There are over 20 studies looking at how gout was managed and the percentage of people who were managed with their uric acid gotten into the goal level, most patients less than six. We'll talk more about that. But in that level of uh, less than six, it was significantly less than 50% of people were controlled. And when they compared how people were about staying on their medication, they looked at seven other diseases, gout was the worst. People tend to stop their medicines. So even if they get all the right medicines, people tend to stop them. And hopefully this will encourage you not to do that. So this is a study looking at five years what happens if you follow patients for five years? So along that x-axis here, we have up to 60 months. So that's a five-year study. And on the y-axis, we're looking at the percentage of subjects that are having attacks. So people who are in a study and were being followed over time. And these are people who succeeded with medication in getting their uric acid down below six. So the question was, what percentage of them were getting attacks at any given time? So I show this slide to patients very often because I show them that if you look on the left, that in the beginning, in the first two, four, six months after starting, as many as 28% of people are still getting attacks. So you're still seeing attacks here. In fact, sometimes you even see more than before they started the medicine. But if you follow people out over time, by the time you get out to 24 months, two years, you're down below 5%. By the time you're out here, all the way out to the right, you're out to 60 months, you're down to zero. In that, in that group of patients, there's about 124 patients who got to that point of 60 months, they had no attacks. So the dramatic difference in number of flares that can be uh, gotten to by people if they stay on their medicine is, is really dramatic. And I have people who come back a year later after I first saw them, and they still remember this slide, and by that time, generally, they're not having attacks. So that I put a little circle on that part of the slide, just reminding you that by the time you get out there, by the time people get out to four or five years, almost nobody is having attacks at that point. And that's absolutely what I see in my practice. When people come back a couple of years later, they're almost always saying to me, if they stayed on their medicine, they're almost always saying that I have nothing, that gout just stopped being part of my life. So let's talk about what causes gout. So gout, we know, is due to deposits of 
uric acid crystals. It's called sodium urate. That's the form of it that, that makes crystals. And what happens is those crystals build up in the joint, and the body sees them as a foreign body. It sees them as something that it, that it needs to attack. Like if you got a splinter, uh, the, uh, the body says, this is something that's, that's foreign to me. That's not something that, um, that should be there. And the body attacks it with white cells and brings fluid into the area. And so you get all the signs of inflammation. You get redness and heat and swelling. And the, this, is, this slide is showing the classical joint for gout, which is the bunion joint, the, uh, the base of the first toe. And this happens to show somebody who's more advanced with gout, who's getting a buildup of uric acid crystals. We call that a tophus. Uh, it's a collection of thousands and thousands of uric acid crystals. And that, that is not rare to happen in people who don't get managed. If you don't get treated early on, then down the road, you can get these deposits of uric acid that are bumps that you can actually feel, feel under the skin. And so those crystals periodically get released into the joint. Body sees them as foreign, body attacks them. You get this inflammatory reaction and it's what you feel as gout and it can be you know, this very intensely painful process. So this is just another way to look at it. If uh, on the left is a normal toe and the, the normal joint where the <clears throat> toe meets up with the, with the foot. Uh, and then this is how a tophus develops, that you've got this lining tissue, the lining tissue of the joint called the synovium. And then you've got these crystals that gradually form. And then periodically enough of them get released into the joint fluid that the body attacks them and you get this gout episode. We know that gout, is considered a periodic illness that, at least in the beginning, it's almost never all the time. You'll have it, you'll get an attack, and then it'll be quiet, and then you get an attack again. Even people who have these tophi, who have these big collections of, of crystals, they often have periods where they've got a bump, but if they touch it, it doesn't hurt, it's not hot, it's not red, it's quiet, but then it goes into an inflammatory phase. Some of the crystals get released into the joint fluid, and you get this painful episode um, of, of gout. That's one of the characteristics of gout. Fortunately for some people, if they have gout for many years, they can start to have gout all the time where you have pain chronically, but we really wanna get in and treat people before they get to that phase when they're still getting it intermittently. I'll get back to this, but that, that's one of the ironic things about gout is because it has these periods where you're normal in between, people like to think that their gout is done. They get a terrible episode, it's really painful, but then they'll go four or five, six months with nothing. And so what happens is they stop their medicine. You know, people are on lots of medicines. People don't like to be on a lot of uh, medication. So they'll say, well, my gout's doing well. Why don't I just stop that drug? And part of the reason for this kind of discussion is to talk people out of doing that, that if you're gonna pick a drug to stop, your gout medicine is usually a bad choice because the the gout medicine generally has a very good, what we call benefit to risk ratio. The amount of good that you get out of the drug is much higher than the risk. So in general, it's not a good choice to stop your gout medication. And this is what the crystals look like. If someone has a swollen joint with gout and we put a needle in and take some of that fluid out, which often we don't need to do. Sometimes the case is so classical that you don't really have to prove it with crystals, but sometimes we do. If somebody gets in the joint like a knee with a lot of different things that could cause that kind of swelling, it's really important for us to get fluid out and look under the microscope. And there's a special attachment to a microscope called a polarizing uh, attachment. And that allows the crystals to be seen with different colors. And what happens is when there's a certain axis in the, in the, the way the axis goes is from the lower left to the upper right. And if it's parallel to that axis, it's yellow. And if it's perpendicular to the axis, it's blue, and they have this needle shape. So it's very characteristic. So if we have these crystals that are needle shaped and have the right colors, and that when you have a certain axis on, on the microscope, you can say these are absolute uric acid crystals and make a definitive diagnosis of gout. I say in many patients, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but in many patients, you can make a pretty definitive diagnosis of gout without seeing these crystals. But in some people who don't have an absolutely classical picture, it's very important to, to get the crystals so you're, you're sure, since we're talking about lifetime of treatment. So the history of gout. So I'm giving you this stat. I'm saying we know that uric acid crystals cause this problem, and if you put a needle in, you'll see them. But we didn't always know this. How, how, do, 
how do doctors know this now? So it's an interesting history of how we got to know this. So back in uh, Hippocrates' day, 470, he was born in 470 uh, BC. So he described pedagra, which means pain in a toe, a foot trap. And I uh, used culture scenes back then. It's a naturally growing plant and they use culture scene. So he knew gout, but he certainly didn't know that there was uric acid crystals in there. That was not something that, that he had any idea of. He thought it was evil humors. They, they really didn't know. So, and that's the colchicium plant. That's where colchicine comes from. And we still use it today. Uh, and then uh, von Leeuwenhoek was the first one to actually see uric acid crystals on the microscope. So he was able to take fluid from a gouty uh, joint and, and they were able to, uh, to see these uh, crystals uh, under the microscope. It was um, the first time that that was ever done. Um, and then Dr. Thomas Seidenham, uh, back in the 17th century, described the gout attack in 1683, uh, and his description is felt to be so classical that it's still, still a perfect description now. And if a patient comes in and gives me this kind of story, it really makes me think that it's likely to be gout, because gout has this very rapid acceleration, and that's part of the pattern of, of gout. So he describes somebody who goes to bed feeling fine, uh, walking around that day, goes to bed feeling fine, and wakes up at two o'clock in the morning, and it's often a man, since we know that men get more gout than women, although after menopause, women start to catch up, but classic would be a man, wakes up at two o'clock in the morning with severe pain in the big toe. It could be in the ankle, it could be in the heel. Uh, occasionally, the first attack could be in the knee, it could even be in more unusual spots, but the classic spot is the great toe, and it's very intense. He said he felt like a dislocation, and he chills and shiver and a little fever, and that's common with gout as well. Uh, and it starts moderate and becomes intense very rapidly. The chills increase, and it comes to a full point, and it's sort of all, it can sort of extend around the foot. We often see people who've got the big toe as the worst spot, but they get redness along the top of the foot. And he says he had a sense of violence, stretching and tearing at the ligaments, that annoying pain, pressure, tightening. And so exquisite is the feeling that it cannot bear the weight of bedclothes. And I, I've heard that a hundred times from people that they said it's so painful they couldn't even bear having a sheet on the toe. And he was describing this in 1683. So then here is a doctor um, uh, in, our, in, a, in the 1900s who actually um, injected, you know, for, for perfect demonstration of a cause of something, what you need to do is to actually show that if you put the thing you think is causing it into the place where you think things are happening, you can demonstrate it. So if you have, if we say that we think that uric acid crystals are causing gout, the only way to be absolutely sure of that, even if you had people with gout and you found crystals in them, maybe it was something else. So the only way to really prove it is you've got to inject somebody with crystals and see if it causes gout. And this doctor volunteered himself. He was a gout expert uh, in Medical College of Wisconsin, and he injected himself with uric acid crystals and sure enough got a big gout attack. Uh, and his knee got swollen and red and hot, and he was able to demonstrate that these, these crystals do cause an, uh, the gout attack. So that's how we came to understand the crystals. It took a long time, and this is an ancient disease, but our understanding is still relatively new. All right, so how do we know that somebody has gout? There's a lot, I certainly see people who think they have gout and they've got something else, and I have people who think they have something else that have gout. So how do we make that distinction? As, as you can see, since I'm suggesting that it's really a curable disease, if we can make a right diagnosis, how, how are we sure? So there's been a lot of work trying to define that. So first of all, and a lot of this you'll see is, is it's kind of common sense based on what we understand about the disease. That's, those are the criteria we use to make the diagnosis. So the, the more intense red is the most common joints. I mentioned the big toe is particularly common. And common is the midfoot, the ankle, the knee, the elbow bursa is pretty common, not the elbow joint, but the little sac sitting over the elbow. Less common is the wrist and the shoulder and the fingers. The, the longer the disease goes on, the more likely you are to have unusual joints. 
but the pattern is important. So if somebody comes in with a big toe, that really suggests gout. There are other things that can be in the big toe, but it's, it's very helpful, especially if it has that rapid acceleration the way Dr. Seidenham had described in the 1600s. So it isn't always easy to diagnose gout. Sometimes it is easy. Somebody comes in with their fourth attack of rapid acceleration swelling in the first toe, their uric acid level is high in the blood, and they've got gout. Sometimes you need fluid. Uh, if there's a question of an infection of the joint, the fluid has to be taken out. Even Lyme disease can cause a red hot ankle or, or knee that can fool you. Uh, calcium crystals called pseudogout, those are not uric acid crystals, but they can cause a swollen ankle or knee that's very intense and look like gout. Of course, you could be fooled by a joint infection, so if there's any question of infection, the fluid needs to be taken out and analyzed, get a culture. Even rheumatoid arthritis can fool you sometimes, although usually rheumatoid arthritis is painful, but not as intense as gout. Gout patients almost always say their pain is 10 out of 10, whereas rheumatoid arthritis, it's more five, six, really intense and rapid acceleration very much suggests gout. So just looking at the spectrum of gout, how gout develops is that everybody has high uric acid, everybody who ultimately gets gout has a period where they have no symptoms, but they have a high uric acid level. Then they get their first attack. Then they go into what's called the intercritical period. That's the time in between attacks when they feel good, but they've got gout. Once you have one attack of gout, you've got gout. It's not like it's going away. We know that if you go in four months later after somebody has an attack and put a needle in and took fluid out, we wouldn't normally do that, but it was done as part of a study and you still can find crystals. So once somebody's got gout, they've got it and the odds are huge and this is well known from studies. Once somebody has one attack of gout, they're almost sure to get more. Some people are lucky and have a long period between the first and the second, but once you get two attacks in a year, it essentially always accelerates. Then the next year it's three and the next year it's four. That's why we call it a chronic and progressive disease. And it can go on to advanced gout where people can have frequent or constant joint pain and they can get these lumps of bumps that we call TOFI. So just looking at it another way, this is just showing high uric acid without signs of gout. Then you get an acute flare with hot red inflamed joint. Between flares, you can feel good, but you still have crystals. But then you could go on to advanced gout with frequent pain, TOFI, and joint damage. And this is what's happening is that with uncontrolled uric acid level, you keep going on to these next stages of gout. And our goal as people treating gout is to try to stop this, to say, okay, you've had two flares, you've had three flares, that's enough. You've had two flares in a year, we need to do something so you don't go on to these more advanced stages. And this is just another way of looking at the same thing just important to think about this because everybody with gout is at certain a certain stage here. So it, it's good to think about it so that you get the right treatment. So you get this stage of no symptoms. The uh, y-axis here is the intensity of pain. So you get your first flare here. And then this period could even be five years. And that's why we don't always start medication for somebody if they just have one attack because they may go many years before they get another one. But once they start getting the attacks closer and the intercritical periods get shorter and the flares become longer and more severe, we really need to intervene. So all the guidelines out there uh, are talking about two attacks in a year. In certain cases, one attack is good enough. If somebody has a tophus, one of those lumps of uric acid, that's enough. We need to get in there and lower the uric acid. If somebody has one attack, but they also have a kidney is abnormal, that's enough reason to get in there and, and treat. Gout also can be associated with kidney stones. So you don't want people to get into this stage of advanced gout here where they have TOFI and can have chronic pain. Okay, so how do we diagnose gout? So we want to know which joints are involved. I showed you the ones that are that are more common, and we'll look and we're saying, what is the attack like? Are the joints red? Usually in rheumatoid arthritis, they're not red. Usually they're swollen, but they're not intensely red the way a gout joint is. And the intensity of the tenderness really fits for gout. We just look at it hard and it, and it hurts. Um, and does the attack end and the joint look normal? Rheumatoid arthritis, generally what happens, you get swelling and may go down a little bit, but even two months later, there's still something. You can still see that there's swelling. Whereas with a gout patient, they could be very intensely in pain and a lot of swelling, and you see them a month later and they look 100% normal. We look, is there a tophus? What's the uric acid level? And does, if they've had any imaging, x-ray, ultrasound, CAT scan, does any of those things show evidence of gout? 
So in the lower right here, I'll show you this uh, enlarged in a second, but this is what's been developed is a scoring system that we use to try to decide whether somebody has gout or doesn't, and each, each thing gives us points. If you take fluid out of the joint and see crystals, that's it, you're done. We've got a diagnosis, you don't have to do this anymore. But if you don't have crystals, then the question is, is it classical? Is it in the first MTP joint? That's the bunion joint. Is it, is it just in one joint? Because gout likes to go to one joint in the beginning. Is it the ankle or the midfoot? If those things happen, you get points. But actually, let me move to the bigger picture so you see it a little better. You need eight points to make a diagnosis. So this looks detailed, but it's really all the common sense things about gout. You know, is, it, is it in the bunion joint? Is it in the ankle or midfoot areas where it tends to be? If it starts in the shoulder, then maybe it's gout, but you better think about something else because that's not a typical presentation. If there's redness, you get a point. If you can't bear touching it, if you have difficulty walking, all those things give you points. If it's very rapid acceleration, time to maximal pain less than 24 hours. If it's less than, if it lasts less than two weeks, if they're good in between the episodes, all of those things get your points towards gout. If you have a tophus, if you have a bump, you get four points. Uh, if your uric acid is greater than 10, you get four points. If it's less than four, you lose four points because if you don't see the crisp, if, you, if the uh, uric acid is very low, they probably don't have gout. So it, you could have somebody whose uric acid is, let's say, five and still have gout, but it's unusual, so you don't get any points for that. And then if imaging shows typical gout changes, you get points. But I can say that many patients who I see can have greater than eight points without my ever getting the crystals. So this can help make the diagnosis without having uh, any fluid removed from the joint. All right, so facts and misconceptions about diet and gout. Certainly everybody talks about diet and gout and it, it can be made extremely uh, complicated. So uh, this is uh, just reminding you, uh, there's a, a gout cafe in Buenos Aires. Um, uh, they serve some things that uh, may not be good for gout and some that may be, but Let's talk a little detail. This is an infographic that we made uh, for a hospital, just reminding people uh, about what you want to think about with diet and gout. So shellfish, red meat, high fructose corn syrup, like in regularly sweetened sodas, and all types of alcohol, especially beer, that's really the big four. Uh, we don't, you, you can't limit everything. We, we try to, we've had a nutritionist uh, who is at our, our uh, public symposium, and, and she was making the point, we know that gout patients are at increased heart risk. Uh, they tend to have a lot of other medical conditions, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, but more heart disease, more overweight, more high cholesterol, more kidney problems. So you want to have a diet that's generally healthy also, and fortunately, you can combine. Uh, so by limiting shellfish, red meat, high fructose corn syrup, and alcohol, that sort of covers it. You'll see things online talking about asparagus, and we don't limit any vegetables. Uh, things like turkey and chicken, we really say, are okay, it's impossible to eliminate all the proteins, and we're not, and we don't think that you should. If you can limit those things, that that really uh, moves things along. Weight loss is helpful. Weight loss can help to decrease gout attacks. And people say, what can we take that is good? Uh, what, what foods are actually good. And there is some evidence that low-fat dairy products, such as milk, may lower the uric acid a little bit. Uh, this part's a little frustrating, that vitamin C does have a small effect at helping the body lower uric acid. It makes uric acid come out in the urine, and cherry juice does have vitamin C. However, I have to qualify that by saying that they did a study in about 50 patients with gout, and in the, in the gout patients, the cherry juice actually didn't lower the uric acid. It was only in the normal control people, people who didn't have gout. But the problem is that 90% of gout patients have a very intense reabsorption of uric acid in the kidney and pull it back into the body. And it may well overcome the effect of, of, vitamins, of the vitamin C and cherry juice. So cherry juice may have some effect, but I, I, the general way that I look at it is that the treatments that we have for gout, like gallup journal are probably a thousand times more effective than cherry juice at lowering the uric acid. So if somebody can take the usual drugs for gout, cherry juice probably doesn't have a great role. Not that I can't say that I have many patients who, who use it, but the data is really not impressive that, that, that that's the way to get your uric acid down. 
Look, hydration is important. It, it has been shown that it can reduce gout flares and certainly can reduce kidney stone risk. About two quarts a day is important, certainly if it's very hot or you're exercising. It doesn't not seem to help to have five quarts. I have some people come in and think that, that if you have a huge amount, you're going to wash out the crystals from your body, and we really have no evidence of that. It's just very important to maintain good hydration. All right, so here, getting back to the creaky joint survey. So this is a question to people. They said, uh, hereditary factors are more important than diet and gout. So that's a true statement that your, your genetics are much more important. We know that you and your friend could both eat exactly the same things, let's say the worst possible things for gout, and yet you get gout and your friend doesn't. Now, why is that? It's because it's your genetics. It's whether you're either making too much uric acid or your kidney is pulling back too much uric acid into your system. So only 35% of people in that survey of the 1,000 patients knew that that was the case. People thought diet was more important. So it's an it's it's important thing to know that although we want you to watch your diet, if you just watch your diet, you probably won't control your gout. You probably need to do both. And then looked at a different way. The question was, diet is the primary contributor to elevated serum uric acid level, true or false? And again, that, that's a false statement. The genetics is the main issue. And yet, only 20% of people got that right. So I think there's a general feeling in, among people that diet is sort of, that's it. And, you know, and, and it's your own fault. If you got gout, it's because you ate the wrong thing. And although diet's important, you got gout because you have the genetics for gout. That's why you got it. And that's why your friend who eats all the wrong things didn't get it. And here's another question from the Creaky Joint Survey. For most patients, gout symptoms can be controlled with only modifications to diet and alcohol consumption, true or false. And again, that's false, but only 32% of people answered it that way. All right, so facts and misconceptions about medications for gout. So this is an infographic that uh, we did in our hospital. So nine out of 10 patients we got have at least one or more of the following medical conditions that make managing gout more difficult. So kidney problem, heart, coronary heart disease, obesity, high cholesterol, or triglycerides, or diabetes. This is important for so many reasons because some of our medicines, you have to be careful. If somebody's diabetic, you don't want to give them steroids. Uh, if they've got kidney problem, you have to be careful with anti-inflammatory drugs like naproxen. Uh, plus, it also crowds out medical visits. People who have gout often come to the internist. They have so many other problems that they never even talk about gout. And that's certainly a message from this discussion is that if you have gout, and you're having attacks and you go to your internist, even if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, make sure you tell them that you're having gout attacks because we can make those attacks go away. But if you don't bring it up, the doctor can assume that you're doing okay. And many people are on medicine for gout, let's say allopurinol, and still not doing okay because their dose is not high enough. It's not high enough to get that uric acid below six. So those people need to tell the doctor that they're still having attacks. That'll remind the doctor to get the uric acid level, see what's going on, and then possibly change the dose of the medication. Okay, so challenges in gout management. Patients don't take their medication. We know that all the surveys show that, that either they weren't prescribed the medication or they weren't treated to the target of less than six, or they were given the right medicine, but they're not taking it. And I mentioned that other medical conditions like kidney problems make treatment harder. And common doses of uric acid-lowering therapy, like 300 milligrams of allopurinol, which is the most common dose that's used out there, don't always lead to reaching the goal. Some people on 300 of allopurinol have a uric acid of 7.5. They need either more allopurinol or a different drug. They need to be managed. And some patients are so severe that the usual drugs that we use to lower gut are, are too slow and we need more aggressive treatments. We even have an intravenous treatment that lowers the uric acid very dramatically, and that can be done in people with these big bumps who are not getting better with every, anything that we do. So why don't people take their urate-lowering therapy? Because they feel better and they stop. They use alternative therapies like cherry juice exclusively, which, as I mentioned, is not likely to take the uric acid down very far. They may be overly concerned about the side effects of medication. Fortunately, drugs like allopurinol long-term have a pretty good safety profile. In general, the benefit versus risk is very high. There's a lot of good and a small amount of bad. Nothing's without risk. But often people are so concerned about side effects 
that they suffer from the disease that the, that the medication could, could essentially cure if they stayed on it. Uh, people get flares when they first thought a uh, drug like allopurinol, and they think, well, obviously it's the wrong drug, but it's not because I mentioned that you can get these flares early on when you start the drug. People with other medical problems decide they're on too many pills, they have to drop something, they say, oh, my gout's not doing too badly, so they stop it. Probably not a good idea, and I mentioned that the gout visit gets crowded out by all these other problems, and you may not even discuss the gout. We can do better with gout. Uh, this is uh, what I mentioned, that rescue medication. So what are the kinds of medicines we have for gout? Rescue means you get an attack, we give you prednisone or an anti-inflammatory like naproxen or ibuprofen um, or a local injection or colchicine, you get a medicine for an attack. Uh, maintenance medication, that's like allopurinol, a medicine to keep the uric acid low. And then we call it bridge medication. That's a medication to try to prevent those early attacks. Often that's colchicine but we use a medicine to try to prevent those early attacks. And that's just the details of it that the rescue medicines include, prednisone, colchicine, anti-inflammatory medicines, uh, local steroid injection, the maintenance medications, allopurinol, fibuzostat, cinaret, probenicid, diglodicase, that's the IV drug. So there are different medicines that apply to different people. Generally, uh, allopurinol is the most common drug to start, and some people they might start with fibuzostat and then you add on or change depending on how the person is doing, and the bridge medication, most commonly colchicine, sometimes will load those anti-inflammatory like naproxen. So why do we need bridge medication? We think of it like an iceberg. What happens when you first start lowering the uh, uric acid in the blood, it starts to pull crystals out of the joint. It's like uh, when an iceberg melts and you see these flow of tiny particles of, of uh, the iceberg coming out, and those are now able to be seen by your, your, uh, your white cells in the joint fluid. The white cells attack it like a foreign body and cause the flare. So you have this iceberg kind of effect. As the crystals are coming out, it sets off attacks. Uh, this is from a needs assessment that we did at our hospital, asking people, how many months without gout attacks can you stop bridge therapy? Uh, do, they, do they understand bridge therapy? And I guess as, as some of you out there may not have heard of that concept, uh, 45%, 47% of people in our survey said they weren't sure. They really didn't know about bridge therapy. The people who did pick a time did most commonly pick the right amount of time, which is six months. That's what the recommendation is for how long to keep somebody on something like colchicine. Uh, the most common side effects of gout medications, colchicine cause diarrhea, the medicines lowering uric acid, allopurinol and fibuzostat can affect the liver. Like many medications, you have to follow it up. Uh, tends to be reversible. They can cause skin rash, occasionally a severe skin rash. Uh, prednisone steroid for gout can keep you up. It can upset your stomach, but we're only using it for a short period of time. Anti-inflammatory drugs like naproxen or ibuprofen can bother your stomach, raise your blood pressure, can have effect on the kidney, and those drugs do have a heart warning, uh, so we have to be cautious about that in the wrong people. So uh, the last area is working with your physician to try to stop gout. So how do you think about this? So somebody who's got gout, first of all, you want to know your goal, uric acid. And most people at six, people who have those bumps, the, uh, the TOFI, their goal is less than five. So you want to know it and you want to ask about it, just like you ask what your blood pressure is or if you have diabetes, you ask what your hemoglobin A1C is. If you have gout, ask what your uric acid is. And if they haven't checked it in a year, ask them to check it again and see where you are. Uh, watch your diet, especially early in the treatment. We know that people get away with a little cheating on their diet after a couple of years once the crystals have been taken out of their joints. But in the beginning, especially in that first six months when you're at risk of those, like the iceberg breaking down, you really want to watch your diet then. That's when it's the most important. Take your medication even if you're feeling good because it's going to come back. Uh, follow up your labs even if you're feeling good. If gout's doing well, you still want to know what your uric acid like. And for the first six months, Think about that bridge medication, such as colchicine, for the full time that the doctor says to do it. So it's important because otherwise you'll have more flares. I mean, you could say, well, I'll get flares and I'll treat them, but some people get really bad flares and it's, it's worth trying to prevent them. So back to Creaky Joint Survey, they asked, how many of your gout attacks do you report to your doctor or healthcare professional? This is out of that thousand patients. So. 50% of people did not report all their gout attacks. And 
that's been shown in many focus groups that people will go in, they'll have an evaluation for hypertension, diabetes, they'll have had three gout attacks since the last visit, but they won't talk about them because they'll think that the doctor can't do anything about it. The reality is they can. They can change their medicine, change the dose, and ultimately get the uric acid down to goal, which will pull the crystals out of the joint and stop the attacks. So gout is basically curable. Again, we put it in quotes because you need to stay on medication, but it requires patience and discipline, but the rewards are, are really great. Uh, these are a couple of resources. Uh, if you want more information uh, about gout, uh, Creaky Joints has uh, the survey results, uh, patient, patient resources. Medline Plus is from the NIH, has reliable patient resources. Uh, our hospital has uh, many um, resources for patients, lots of articles about gout. Uh, and there's a Gout Education Society, which has many patient resources uh, as well. Uh, and that's the end of the formal presentation, and I'll be uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Fields. That was uh, really interesting and informative, and um, I think we do have a bunch of questions. So um, a question from a participant, first of all. Um, I noticed um, on the, the slide where you showed uh, sort of color-coded where it was most common, uh, the most common places that gout um, attack locations. Uh, and one body part that was not on there uh, was the hip. And I wonder, yeah. um, is, does it ever occur in other joints? Like they're, they may be just extremely uncommon, so it didn't make it on this chart, but I, so someone asked about the hip. Yep, no, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, um, the hip <clears throat> is not there on that slide. And for, for a good reason, because it's extremely rare in the hip. I actually have seen one case on, on our consultation service at New York Hospital. I saw one patient, but it's, it's a cliche that when I'm the, uh, attending on the consult service and uh, one of the trainees said to me, well, we just got called for uh, a patient who has a history of gout and has hip pain. I always say to them, the odds are it's something else. It's either it's a fracture or it's osteoarthritis or it's an infection or it's something else because gout in the hip is really rare. We did have a patient about a year ago where they took fluid out of the hip and sure enough, she had gout, but um, that's very rare. So if, if somebody has hip pain and gout, it's probably something else. Okay, thanks. And on the same slide, is there a preference um, for does it mean something different to say a gout attack versus a gout flare or is that are those synonyms right <clears throat> that's a good question it, it they're basically synonyms the um there are people who some rheumatologists who've been working on what is the best language to describe things about gout and they felt that gout flare is a better term than gout attack <laughs> because they, they wanted something that expressed the concept that gout is a long-term illness. It's not like you get bronchitis now and you get bronchitis again four years from now and they're totally distinct. With gout, it's, it's a chronic disease with intermittent flares. So that's why they prefer, gout attack sort of sounds like something out of the blue. You, know, you get this attack and then if it comes again five years later, it has nothing to do with the first one. So that's why, they prefer the term gout flare because it expresses that concept that even when you're feeling good, you've still got gout, you still got to take your medication, and you get these intermittent flares that we want to prevent. So we prefer the term flare. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's thank you. That's very helpful. Um, the next question is, uh, and I guess this is related actually to the concept of, of uh, gout as a, a chronic condition, is gout uh, also, um, is it considered an autoimmune disease? Because even just the concept of sort of rescue or bridge medications um, and, and then maintenance medications sounds like other conditions I'm familiar with, like asthma or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so is it in that same category? Well, it, it's not in the sense that it's not an autoimmune disease. It's not, you don't have antibodies in your system. It's actually... Um, a local immune disease. It, it, what's happening, I, I like to think of it the way I use the splinter analogy, that what happens is you build up this material, these uric acid crystals, and the body attacks them as a foreign body. So it's, an, it's your immune cells that are attacking the crystals locally, 
but it's not like lupus where you have this ANA antibody or rheumatoid arthritis and you have rheumatoid factor and CCT antibodies. It's not autoimmune in that way. And it's not autoimmune in the same way as asthma where your body develops, uh, you sort of attack your own, your own tissue. It's not exactly like that. It's, it's a attack on a local material that gets deposited in joints and your immune system goes after it. So the mechanism is different, but it's still an, an immune disease. It still involves your immune system. And that's why the, the treatment sounds similar because we're going after the immune system. I see, okay. Is there a reason why men tend to get gout more often than women and, and except, you know, after menopause, it starts to catch up. Is it that hormone like estrogen is protective? Uh, against high uric acid levels, something like that? Um, yeah, yeah that, that, that's definitely a factor, is that women have estrogen, and we know that estrogen makes uric acid come out in the urine, and that helps to keep women's uric acid lower. Um, there's, there's other factors. Women uh, um, may, may eat differently. That there, there are things that, that may also be different, but that, that's, that's certainly the reason we think why women start to get gout after the menopause, that it's unusual. You can see it in, in certain settings, but most of the time, if I see a, a woman with gout, it's after the menopause because she's lost the estrogen and the uric acid starts to build up in the body. And then um, back, back um, one of the slides when it was from the 17th century, I think Dr. Uh, Sindenham, uh, yep. he was describing his patient um, and, and, you know, and the gout, I guess, flare. Um, and he talked about the sort of came on suddenly and there were, there were some fever, chills and shivering. So there's other kind of associated, uh, symptoms, the chills, the, the little fever, is that common in, in what you see in, in gout patients when they're having an, an acute episode or a, a flare? Um, or is that just part of sort of the, the body? Uh, immune response, even a sort of local immune response? Yeah, it, it's not rare. Uh, it, it's pretty common that people at least won't feel right in their body, that it's not totally, it's not all in the toe, because the immune reaction is, is so intense, and some of these inflammatory chemicals get released into the body, so they're not all, all, that, all those um, inflammatory chemicals, we call them cytokines, those inflammatory chemicals that are getting released as the as the uh, white cells are attacking the crystals, some of those chemicals go into the system, and some people are actually pretty intensely systemically ill. They they can get shaking chills just like he did, and, they, and fever is not rare. In fact, that's in the emergency room, for example, when we get called to see gout in the emergency room, since you know you, you would imagine that it's the people with the worst attacks that tend to come to the emergency room. It's not rare that they're calling us because they can't decide if the person's got an infection in their ankle or they have gout. And, and in the bad attacks, you can see the whole foot gets red, that when we examine them, we can see that the tenderness is all, let's say, at the ankle or the big toe, but the whole top of the of foot is red, and the person may have a low grade or even a, even a pretty significant fever, and they can have chills. And we've had people, it was very gratifying for us, we've had times where our team goes down see somebody in the emergency room and the, the attending in the emergency room will say, well, I have Mrs. Jones in, in room six and we're going to admit her for this really intensely swollen ankle. Um, you know, can you, can you go see her and see what you think? And we go in there and we take fluid out of her ankle because we're worried about infection. And we go and look at it under the microscope and you just see thousands of, of crystals in there. And as you look at the whole picture, you realize that she's really not infected. There was no break in the skin. She's not infected anywhere else. There's no reason why this would be an infection. And we've had people like that that were able to send home and say, this is a gout attack. Let's treat the gout attack. And sure enough, you give them steroid, let's say. And within hours, they're feeling so much better that they're just able to go home instead of being admitted. So absolutely, people can be really systemically ill and look like they have an infection. And um, one other question that came up from your presentation is you, you mentioned that um, one example of, of, uh, of diet that actually is potentially helpful is uh, low-fat dairy as a way of, of lowering uh, uric acid levels. Um, do, do 
do you know why or do we know why um, that that would be the, what it is about uh, dairy? Is it some is, is some relation to calcium or other components it, of milk? Uh, yeah, the, the theory is that the, it's called casein, which is a, a milk protein. Uh, there's some suggestion that that may have an effect on the kidney to increase uric acid coming out in the urine. Uh, but I would I would add that like most of the gout discussion uh, that was part of this presentation, I wouldn't tell people that that's a big factor in getting them better. I, I it's it's almost a, I don't want to say curiosity, but it's it it's something that people want to hear, and I want to tell them that there are some foods that not only are are not bad and not even neutral, but maybe a little good, but the effect is small. So you could drink all the milk you want, and you're not going to get that uric acid down. So it, it's good to know. And I, I've been asked a hundred times. People say, "Well, isn't there anything I can eat that's good?" So we tell them that there was a study <laughs> looking at this. But again, it's the same story as as cherry juice. That um, it's interesting that something that you can just go to the store and get could have some effect. But you have to look at it in the big perspective. Is is it enough to make you better? And it's probably a good time to, to mention this, that they, they did a nice study where they took people with gout and put them in a clinical research unit. So that means that they could close the door of the unit and they could totally control what the people ate. So during the whole time that people were in this study, they only ate the food that they were given, which is probably not what they would have eaten if they were outside, even if somebody gave them a diet. Most people can't be 100% pure, especially if the diet is very not tasty, which this diet was very, very not tasty. So they gave them the lowest possible purine diet. So they had the purine, purines get broken down ultimately to uric acid. So they gave them the lowest possible diet. And in that study, the most they were able to get anybody down on the uric acid was one point. So if somebody has a uric acid of eight, and we want to get them below six, they could be on as low a diet as they gave people in the clinical research unit, which they're not going to be because people just can't tolerate that kind of diet. But even if they said, all I care about in my life is gout, and I'm going to eat, the, I don't care if it's, it's, it's horrible taste, I'm going to do it. Even if they did it, the best they could ever do is get the uric acid from eight to seven. They're not going to get below six. So it's important because eating the wrong things, especially early on when we first start a medication like allopurinol, it's very important to watch your diet because that can set you off and we want to try to have you have no attacks while we're starting the medicine. But the fact is that the strictest diet is rare that it can control your gout. There are some occasional people whose uric acid may be 6.5 and maybe diet would be enough for them and that would be great. But or, or some people who are on a medicine like a diuretic, hydrochlorothiazide, if somebody uses that for their blood pressure and their internist says, well, you know, now that you've got gout, maybe I'll manage your blood pressure with something else because we know that the, the diuretic raises the uric acid. So sometimes if they mm -hmm. watch their diet and they come off the diuretic, maybe they, they'd be able to control the gout. But that's probably one gout patient out of hundreds. Most gout patients, the uric acid is just too high and they're not even on one of these medicines that lowers the uric acid. So they're, they're kind of stuck with taking the medicine. Again, fortunately, the medicine as medicines go is pretty safe and well tolerated. And we use a couple of tricks. We build it up slowly uh, and, and we can have it through pretty safe. Most people are not going to manage just with diet. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, yeah, thank you. Um, and I've heard that as actually as a frequent uh, concern among rheumatologists is, is sort of the frustration that, like you started, you know, like the, the title of this presentation, it's, a, it's an extremely treatable condition, and yet uh, people don't don't understand that it, it, you know, diet alone will not, uh, will typically not uh, do the trick because, as you said, it doesn't lower the uric acid enough. Um, so there's a few questions that have come in. I know we've just got about five minutes left in the hour. A few questions from our um, patient community here that, that have come in. So I'll take each one. Um, Shannon asks, will advance to gout with frequent uh, pain, uh, or sorry, with advanced gout with frequent pain, can it start to look more like tendinitis? Um, in other words, does the pain differ from earlier attacks? 
so I guess I'm not sure advanced scout, maybe that means um, having had it for a long time or something, but with well, advanced scout with frequent pain, can it start to look more like tendonitis? Does the pain differ from earlier attacks? Okay, well, it could theoretically look like tendonitis if it's involving, let's say, the palm of the hand, but I, I think the bigger answer to that question is, is it's, it's a correct, the question's going in the right direction, is that as you have gout for a longer period of time, we tend to see less common joints start to get involved. So even though in the beginning, it's most, most common that it'll be the toe or the ankle uh, or the midfoot or the knee, if somebody has gout for a while, they'll start to get it in the elbow bursa, they'll get it in the wrist and the hand, sometimes the shoulder, uh, it can even be in the spine. Uh, and even, as you said before, even rarely in the hip. But, and, and you can get bumps anywhere. You can get bumps in the palm, you can get them on the elbow, you can get them on the foot. So as gout goes on, it starts adding more unusual areas. So yes, it can, it can masquerade as a lot of things once it gets more advanced. Okay, and uh, someone asks, uh, do the uh, uric uh, acid lowering therapies, uh, do the medications simply reduce or eliminate flares, um, or do they also, are they also reducing the amount of crystals? And then the second part of that question is, and does the continued presence of, of crystals lead to joint, uh, to any joint degradation? Okay, well, that's a great question. So, um, the answer is absolutely these medicines get rid of crystals. And that, in fact, that's important. I tried to get at that, but maybe didn't say enough about it, that when you look at the different medications for gout, they do different things. So for example, if you take naproxen for a flare of gout or take prednisone for an attack of gout, that does nothing for your level of crystals. It just gets at the inflammation. But if you take allopurinol for your gout, that decreases the production of uric acid in your liver and lowers your total body uric acid and pulls it out of the joints. So it long-term gets rid of the crystals. And the second part of the question, absolutely yes, is that if the crystals are sitting in the joint for a long time, they can cause joint damage. And we've seen many people who get destructive changes in the joint that could have been prevented if we got those crystals out earlier. Okay, thanks. Um, this question comes from Willa. I'm, I'm not sure it's specific to gout necessarily, but it's, it's uh, uh, it's about kind of preventive medication for for any uh, maybe joint condition. Uh, the question is, uh, I'm allergic to all preventative medications. I get rash, swelling of my face and lips, stomach problems, et cetera. What is my best course of action? So I guess uh, if there's a more ge general question. How do you, yeah, how do you, how do you uh, work with patients if, if they're not responding well or getting kind of bad side effects or reactions to certain medications? Right. So uh, one, one slide I had was looking at what options do you have for, for managing gout? And we do have five or six drugs that are available now. And it's certainly possible that one person could be allergic to all of them. But fortunately, there's no what we call cross reaction. So for example, if somebody is allergic to allopurinol, let's say they get a skin rash with allopurinol, it does not look like they're likely to get a skin rash to Fibuzostat, which is an alternative drug that, that lowers the, the uric acid as well. So in general, if somebody gets a rash to allopurinol, we give them Fibuzostat, they do okay. Now, some people are unfortunate and are so allergic that, that we can't use that. Well, there's other medicines. There's medicines that make uric acid come out in the urine. And somebody with terrible gout who couldn't take anything else, we have this intravenous medication, which is totally unrelated to any of the others. So they're not likely to have an allergy to that just because you had an allergy to one of the others. So we try all the options. If somebody was truly allergic to all of them when none of them work, they might be somebody you would try to have the most weight loss. You try to watch their diet as best as you could. But I would just say that some of the patients I've seen, there's almost nobody who can't take any of these drugs, that almost everybody you can find something. I'd say it's 999 out of 1,000 you can find a drug that helps them that they can tolerate. But, you know, there's always somebody who's unfortunate enough they can't take anything. Right. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, it looks like we are at the uh, out of time. And I, I just in closing, I wanted to say thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fields, for your your time uh, with us. Uh, it's been extremely informative. And, and I guess I, I, for one, am walking away with the sense that there's a lot of good news about 
scout that it's extremely um, treatable and that um, that there is a, there's kind of a lot of uh, tools in the in the arsenal to to uh, to address scout um, and that um, I guess the the more difficult challenge is just helping people get a better understanding of of gout as something that is not able to be managed um, by diet alone or just not particularly effective um, as, as much as the sort of range of, of treatments are. Um, but it is, it is something that, that um, even if, if it is a chronic condition that is, is uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward to maintain it. Um, so again, thank you so much for your time. And um, we uh, look forward to, to being able to uh, post this recording so other people um, who missed this, the live webinar would be able to benefit from it. Um, any final words before we sign off this evening? Yeah, I think the main the main message is if you have gout, that you really should have a lot of hope that you can get rid of it, and you really should speak up to your doctor and tell them exactly how many attacks you're having, what kind of problems you're having, and talk about all the options, because there are a lot of options, and the vast majority of people, if they get the right option for them, they get the dose correct, and stick with it, uh, they'll really do well. So I think it's something people should really know about and talk to the doc about. Great. Well, thanks again uh, for your time and um, have, a, have a great rest of your evening and your week, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for this Creaky Joints uh, webinar on uh, Gout Awareness Day. Bye-bye.